Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker. And as all of you know, I do enjoy catching up with fellow ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, especially ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who can shed some light on the more abusive side of the organisation. Today, I am joined by Lacey, whose story featured in the recent hearings in the recent ICSA hearings, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse. Lacey, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, finally. <laughs> finally, we get to do this. So we we had you on the ICSA debrief Watchtower in Focus episode, but you were incognito at the time because you were still under a confidentiality undertaking. You were PRA 42 in the that is me, in the flesh. But now you can come out and tell your story because we've managed to, I think you've waived your, your confidentiality and all of that's gone through with ICSA. So we're free to hear your story. So thank you for sharing it. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to. So let's start at the beginning. How did you wind up in uh, this organization so by birthright <laughs> i guess so from the womb probably being read my book of bible stories and i was yeah brought and brought up raised in it by my mom and dad and then later by my mom and my stepdad for those who have never been jehovah's witnesses how would you describe that upbringing do you what would you say to those who would say, well, it's no different to perhaps being raised in the C of E or in the Catholic Church? Oh, very, very different. Um, I don't really want to slam a lot of it, um, but it, it is like child abuse in various different forms, sort of the organisation. And like I say, from when you're very small or even in the womb, you're already being taught things about the Bible. As a baby, a lot of parents will ask their children, you know, where, where's Jehovah? And, you know, the children are like pointing upwards. So even from a very early age, it's forced upon you and you have no other choice. And you can never really say that you don't really want to be in it because you fear that you'll upset your parents so you have this sort of life where you're not free to do or say anything you want to you have to do things by the religion's rules and not necessarily your parents rules because their rules are also the religion's rules so you don't have any freedom to think how you want, speak how you want, dress how you want, act how you want, pick your friends. You're not even allowed to do that, really. So it's it's very different. This very sort of lack of freedom is the best way I think I can word it. And obviously, in, in any religion, you have people who take the religion seriously to varying degrees. So one being not very seriously and ten being very you know, very seriously, how seriously did you take your beliefs as a witness? Oh, it varied throughout my life, I think. I think you get to that sort of age, maybe um, 14 to 17 is sort of an age where you feel like you want to be really self-righteous and show that you're a really good example in the congregation because you're at an age where you're getting a lot of pressure of getting baptised and dedicating your life to the organization um so between those ages i think you are sort of i was probably well probably definitely a 10 um so you, know, you can't really go any higher than that i was very zealous with my sure. faith sure um so at what point would you say things started to go wrong in terms of um uh, being preyed upon by someone in the congregation so my mom was divorced uh, when I was very young I think I was about three years old three or four years old and 
then she remarried when I was six to a elder um, who's sort of well known in many, many congregations all over uh, the UK and even abroad. Um, it was Clifford Whiteley. Um, probably a lot of people watching will recognise his name, if not know him personally, because he made himself very um, sort of known to the witnesses. So she married him. And he was in good standing, good standing in the congregation and almost idolised by a lot of people in the organisation because he was good at giving talks. He was a very pious man. Um, very spiritual, everything was scriptural, a uh, perfect example of an ideal witness. Um, so, yeah, he was my stepdad for over 10 years. And when I was about the age of 10 or 11 is when he started to sexually abuse me. I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah, I, I, and unfortunately the position of being an elder will have doubtless made it harder for for others to accept what what he was doing to you presumably once you uh found the courage to to speak out so how did that happen how how were you able or when were you able to uh draw attention to what he'd been doing well it was about 10 years later after it had happened I mean obviously you're right the position of the elder is, is a massive thing within the organization so as a young child you always have that fear living in a family where your dad's an elder of bringing reproach on their name of then tarnishing your family's name because your dad's an elder and the repercussions it means for him and also your family um, so it was 10 years after um, sort of the serious side of the abuse because actually still leading up till last year when he hugged me, he would still grope me. So that had been ongoing for, well, last year. So uh, it was February, actually. I went to stay with my sister who had left the organisation for many, many years. She left yeah, many years ago. And I went out for lunch with her and her husband. And I just recently returned from a two month sort of vacation abroad. I was telling them about it, sort of getting excited about life, new opportunities. It opened me up to a whole other life sort of outside of the organization. Um, even though the reason for going for two months was to be preaching to people, which I did do. Um, but obviously, <laughs> probably not as much. Ah, so you'd you'd gone abroad as a need greater, yeah. um, but you'd probably along the way realised ah maybe there are other things than purely trying to bring people into the organisation in locations that also happen to be uh, very beautiful and attractive places to live. You know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. It was sort of you almost forgot about your life back home and how the congregation works and you know, the meetings and everything you're, you're taught, everything you're told. It's sort of just <laughs> drifted <laughs> because you're actually enjoying your life. You're actually mm. living and you're not living for the organisation. You're living for yourself. Mm. So I sort of was really happy when I was here. So I was sort of relating my experience and what I could do next in my life and because they weren't they're not witnesses they were very encouraging you know yes you can do it you, you can do whatever you want and then they asked me what what's stopping you and I sort of sat back I was like well you know my my mom because she's still in the religion and there's five of us uh, to her children and I was sort of the last one at home um, I didn't want to upset her by moving away and then I sort of paused. I was like, and then also my stepdad, I was like, Cliff. And then I just started tearing up. And there's been moments in the past where I've nearly told my sister, um, but ne never, never sort of went through with it. But I just welled up and I couldn't control it. And I just started to cry. 
And it was that sort of trying that you can't come back from. You can't sort of laugh and hold, you know, it's nothing. It was sobbing. It was 10 years of this big secret. It was 10 years of abuse by your dad that just suddenly built up. And uh, it was quite a fancy place as well. So I probably caused quite a scene. <laughs> but um, she, then what's wrong? What happened? Is it Cliff? And I managed to sort of, you know, you do a big like, yes. And, you know, what happened? What has he done? Has he done something to you? And, and then it was like another big yes, which after such a long period of time, it was, it, I sort of can't really remember being in that moment. It was such a big thing just to come out and say, yes. Then I had like an instant migraine. I couldn't control my breathing. And that, that is sort of how it, it came out. And then obviously it's not something you say, okay, that happened. We'll carry on eating. We'll move on. It was, oh my God, we need to tell my mom. We've got to sort this out. Now what's going to happen? So that's how it sort of carried on. My sister contacted my mom and said, you need to come here after you finish work. Do not go home do not phone Cliff, come here. So my mum was panicking, what's happened, what's going on? And she didn't tell her over the phone, she said, just come here. So my mum did. That is, I feel as though what, you, what you've just shared is really important in understanding just how virtually impossible it is or how many obstacles there are when it comes to abuse victims, just sharing what happened. And um, especially when you relate the, the physical problems that you had, you, you mentioned a, you know, a migraine and um, like a, a physical repulsion to actually uh, sharing what had happened to you. And for those who haven't been in your shoes, and thankfully most people haven't been in your shoes, um, it, it's probably hard to imagine, but whenever I speak to abuse survivors, it's a recurring theme of just getting the words out is itself almost reliving what happened. In other words, to, to simply acknowledge what happened in a way empowers the abuse or the abuser. Does that make yeah. any sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's sort of... When you keep it a secret, it doesn't really matter how long, whether it's a week, a day, years, months, you suppress it and you suppress it almost instantly. So any so anything that will make you relive is sort of remembering it and then thinking about that person, which instantly then is quite traumatic because you, you know, you, you've suppressed it. So anything that, that triggers it, brings it back up, it brings back everything in, in one flood and for a 10 year period. And in that sort of period, I'd sort of convinced myself um, that he was a wonderful man because that's what everybody else thought. So me and him were actually very close um, compared to my relationship with, with my mom. Um, obviously I understand sort of why it was how it was between us because of what he'd done and how he'd manipulated me but for those years it was very confusing because you convince yourself that you know I love him he's my dad he's a good elder he's very spiritual um, the elders are appointed by Jehovah he's still in his position it, it's all of that you sort of have to force yourself to believe otherwise you, you can't cope so anybody I spoke to would be sharing my stepdad's story and saying, yes, this was, this is Cliff and this is what he's like and isn't he wonderful, and isn't he? Because I had to paint that picture that he was some sort of idol. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to cope. I, I've had very low points during those, those years, sort of self-harm, suicidal thoughts. Very, very, very close to the edge of, of doing something but then um, I'll probably go into that a bit later about the organization how that impacts it so yeah it does sort of bring you back but gi given what you've just shared and again it's it's enormously helpful in you know helping people to understand who've never been in your situation just how many obstacles there are to sharing the truth and, and to verbalizing what happened 
how do you respond to, let's say, a Jehovah's Witness who says, yes, but um, in the literature, it says that victims of abuse have the absolute right to report what happened to the authorities. What do you say to that? I have to laugh, actually, because I wrote a few pointers as reminders of things to say, because I'm very forgetful and I get very carried away in the moment. Mm. And I think actually the, the first thing on my list is absolute right to go to the police. Um, yes, they will tell you that <laughs> and they will say it in that exact way as it is written in their elders handbook. As it is written, you have the absolute right to go to the police. That is all they will offer because they will they they then might as well say, but we have the absolute right to do I don't swear, sod all. Yeah, yeah. About it. They might as well add that at the end. It is absolutely irrelevant saying that, offering mm. that sort of hope that something will be done. It is just absolutely a waste of breath and a waste of print, really. I'm, I'm also thinking in terms of, again, your very visceral um, uh, hesitancy in even sharing what had happened to your sister. Um, so that being the case, surely there needs to be more than simply saying, oh, well, it's your right to go to the police. When when victims find it so hard to verbalise, even to their family members, what's happened, one can only imagine how hard it would be to speak to a police officer and know that there are going to be very serious uh, ramifications from, from sharing that information. Yeah. And you factor in as well the fact that we're talking about an organization that literally says just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean you should do that thing, which yeah. they repeatedly say. Um, so, yeah, I, I can imagine the, the sort of apologetics that you get in the, in the articles and what have you must be very infuriating. Yes. Yeah. You get sort of painted this picture that you're going to get help and they're there to support you. And they're there to keep the congregation clean. And it's just one one big lie, really. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. You don't really know what's going to happen. Yes, we had to tell my mom. My mom then, after I told her, first of all, said, you know, I, I believe you, which was a big thing because you don't even consider that people might not believe you. Um, once you've said it so that was a, a big thing I, it was like you know wow you know thank you you know not that I'd ever expect her to say that she didn't but it was just sort of a shock that you have to expect people that would say well I don't believe you and my mom was also sort of brought up and raised in the religion so she she said she will go and confront him but she will take two elders with her from my local congregation so she phoned two elders, both who known Cliff most of their life as well. They were elders alongside him, good friends of the family. So, yeah, she phoned those elders and she met them. Then they went and confronted Cliff, who then denied it and said, I don't know why she's saying that. I don't know what would make her say that. Um yeah, so that was a bit, like, infuriating. So the elders were like, well, there's nothing really we, we can do at this point because it's obviously that whole one one person's word against the two witness rule. Yeah. The two-witness rule. And the next morning, um, he brought my mum a coffee up because they'd slept in separate beds. And my mum said to him, you know, I'm, I'm asking you again, did you touch my baby? And... He said, yes, but it was once and I'd had a drink. And when I'd heard that, like, it, it, you're already emotionally now re-traumatised. So then to hear him still lying about how many times it had happened and then to try and justify child abuse 
by I had a drink. Because that always happens when you have a drink, doesn't it? Yeah. It makes you abuse children. Yeah. Yeah. So that was just a whole other traumatizing experience. So then my mom was like, you need to phone the elders and tell them. So he did. Which, you know, yes, good, he's admitted it. Now I can finally get help. <laughs> we can get all of this sorted. Um, and that's sort of when it all went tits up. Basically. So when you say uh, tits up, <laughs> what you mean is that um, the okay. elders frustrated a police investigation into your yeah. abuse. That's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's quite a nice polite way of, of putting it, actually. Yeah, I could think yeah. of a few other terms. So how, how did the police come to be involved? So initially, I didn't want to go to the police. Some part of me still wanted to protect him because of how our twisted relationship had been over those few years. It was just let it go. Um, I always used to think, I'll wait till he's dead because he's quite he's quite old and he has a lot of health problems. So I used to always just think in my head, I think that's what kept me going. Wait for him to die and then maybe I'll tell people what had happened, but I'll wait for him to die first. Um, because then, you know, repercussions of him being an elder again, it was all about protecting him. It's very messed up. Um, but my sister said, you don't have to do it if you don't want to but I can report it. So you don't, it doesn't have to come from you, but I can report it. And I was a bit happier with that. So she got in contact with the police and then the police came round to take a statement. So after 10 years of not speaking about something to then have to tell your sister and then your mom and now a police officer, sort of one after the other, very difficult mm. to relive details. Were the police supportive? Police were fantastic. Police were absolutely fantastic. Had no trouble with the police at any point during the case whatsoever, even from the initial lady that had come to take the statement to sort of my video interviews to the police that was in the policeman that was in charge of my case. He was just incredible so we have um an abuser who's confessing at least partially to the crime we have the police actively investigating what went wrong so he had the meeting with the elders and as most meetings go with elders of the congregation of jehovah's witnesses they will make notes of what was said at that meeting and there was also a judicial committee which is where you know, they decide um, whether to kick him out of the congregation I mean the fact that it sort of had to be a judicial and wasn't an instant you're out was a bit unsettling but still so they would have had notes from that committee as he was disfellowshipped it was uh, first announced he was no longer an elder. And then we had to wait a few weeks until it was announced that he was no longer a Jehovah's Witness. So even that was frustrating and no reason was given to the congregation. It was just he's no longer a few an elder. weeks during which he had access to children. Yeah. So from, from being removed as an elder, you're saying. A few weeks later, he was announced as disfellowshipped. Well, yeah. what's, what's, what measures are being taken to protect the congregation, you know? Uh, there wasn't. He was actually attending another congregation at the time in another part of the UK he was attending. I think the elders had got in touch and told the other congregation's elders what the situation was, but that's really not going to do anything to protect anybody. I mean, like, it's not just, he's not just a, a criminal against witnesses. He could do it to any child. It's interesting that the priority in the elder's mind was, oh, we don't want a pedophile on the elder body. And then almost as an afterthought, oh, actually, we'd also better disfellowship him. You yeah. Know. yeah. Yeah. So this is where it went wrong with the elders because he had confessed it to them. 
they had told me and my family that he had admitted it. And when we told the police how it works with the organisation, the first thing the police said, they asked us, will they cooperate? Because our experience with religious sort of when it comes to religion and child abuse is that they don't. And me and my, even my sister. So at the time I was a bit shaken about being in it and obviously she'd left the year. So even she was, no, they absolutely, anything you need, whatever you need, they will help. They will not block anything. They, just ask them whatever, they, they will help. They are not like other religions. And he was like, okay. So when they, he got wind of, you know, there's this document and asked the elders for it, it was a no. <laughs> it was a no. It was a um, no to the document. It was also, more importantly, a no to the a statement. Put the document to one side, a verbal statement that he had admitted to two people, two elders, my mom, so three, what he had done. And the police said, can you give a statement to say that he has admitted it to you? And it was enough. And that was the start of it all sort of falling apart. I had called the elders. I said, come round and explain to me why you're not coming forward. I do not understand why you are not telling the police. So they came round, they sat in front of me on the sofa. I can remember it so clearly. I can remember what it looked like outside, the weather, the time of day, what clouds. I can just remember everything. And I was sat on the floor. And my other sister sat in with me because she also wasn't sure. She was like, no, I don't understand. So she sat in with me. And they did their usual, they said a prayer. They read some scripture about how it would be slander because Cliff had told them in confidence. So it would be slander. If... They definitely used that word. Yes, definitely, definitely. I can't remember, annoyingly, I can remember the weather. I can't mm. remember the scripture. I just remember them reading about slander. Right. And I mean, that in itself was, what the hell? What are you talking mm. about? Why are the, you reason even... that, the reason I ask is that's a crucial point because um one of the historic um criticisms of the organization has been that they have silenced abuse victims by saying that um uh, if you're going to accuse a witness before the police if you're going to report abuse um that doesn't meet the two witness rule criteria you are slandering them and uh, in the current guidelines to elders um they distance themselves from that and they say it's not slander. Um, they, but they don't clarify at what point the rules changed because there's so much anecdotal evidence that slander has been a problem. And your story, which is very recent, I mean, what year did this conversation take place? 2019. 2019 indicates that even though the organization is in its written materials distancing itself from this practice in reality it's still an issue for yeah. whatever reason um which is which adds to the importance of not just saying oh it's not slander but to also train elders that slander is no longer even an issue when it comes to child sexual abuse so the fact that they're not um, going the full mile in in making sure this isn't an issue uh, is testified to by what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So it was. The, I just remember thinking, how is it relevant? How is some scripture about slander even relevant? Why would it be slander against someone that's a child abuser? Mm. So that initially was already a bit of a shock that they were reading that to me. And they said they, they told me the only way they could come forward and give a statement to the police is if they step down as being an elder. And both of these men I have known my whole life, 
before I was born, they were around in the congregation. I have grown up with them. They were my friends. They were like, you know, another father figure. I used to knock doors with them. I used to go to their house. It, 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 you know, that, that congregation is your family. And they told me that. And I, I didn't say anything. I just looked at them. It, it, there's, two, you know, there's two of you. If both of you aren't going to step down, surely one of you will say, okay, so I will step down. Silence, nothing. They, they weren't even looking at me. They were like looking at the floor or looking to the side, avoiding eye contact. So, so when they were saying, if we were to cooperate with the police, we'd have to step down. They were thinking that that was a compelling argument. But yeah. from your perspective as, as the victim, you, you, were, you were waiting for them to complete the, the, the stream of consciousness by saying, therefore, we take the hit because it's more important that the community is protected from a pedophile, you know? Yeah, it was very awkward silence, actually, until I, I sort of leant forward and I just went, but he's a paedophile. And again, still not looking at me, their response was just, yes, we know. And then that was it. And it, I, I can't even express the emotions that happened. I sort of, my face was nearly on the floor. I'd bent so far forward. I was screaming. It wasn't even sobbing and crying. It was that mixed with this screaming. And my sister was trying to, to comfort me. Even my mom ran in from the other room because she could hear me trying to comfort me because what, what are you supposed to say when two people you've trusted and known your whole life have told you what they need to do to come forward with a statement? The problem with my case was that it was historic. It had happened 10 years ago. And for unfortunately, a lot of historic cases there isn't always a positive outcome because it is historic. So we were, this was our one, one good thing. This was our one big thing that could get him convicted. And then it was, this is what we can do to get him convicted, but we're not going to do it, even though we know what he is. Would you, would it be fair to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Would it be fair to say that, your elders being there in the room with you and as much as saying our position as elders is more important than protecting children from a pedophile, yes. would it be fair to say that that re-traumatised you? I, I, I don't know about re-traumatised. It was a whole other traumatised sort of. It was being traumatised in a completely different way. It was the trauma of everything else going on now, with a whole other episode of trauma, of this religion that you've been brought up in, of this family, this family that, that you have, these people you've known your whole life, the people that are there to support you, who tell you it's your absolute right to go to the police, but they're not going to do anything. And at what point, because... Um... Am I right in saying that it wasn't just this episode? Um, the, this whole issue with the police was an ongoing thing where they were trying to extract some evidence from the elders that he'd confessed. Everyone knew he'd confessed. They just needed the evidence, whether it was yeah. in a verbal statement or in a written statement. While all of this was ongoing, um, how were you being treated as a Jehovah's Witness? Well, I sort of, I, I wasn't really treated <laughs> as anything. They came to speak to me initially as, I suppose, a shepherding visit, but there wasn't a lot they could say to me because I said, I don't blame Jehovah. I don't blame the congregation. I don't blame myself for what he did. So normally... I think that they were expecting me to say it's Jehovah's fault or it's the congregation. Like, I don't know what they were expecting, but I, you know, I, I don't blame anybody. I, I, I just recall there being, am I right in saying there was a wedding where you were treated with quite some suspicion? Yes. So they sort of, I hadn't had contact with them much after that. Mm. And I'd moved away from where I lived at the time. And I didn't want to see them again because there was nothing they could say that was 
going to be of any help or use to the case. But I had a witness friend who got who was get, getting married and I was invited to the wedding. And a month or so before the wedding, she'd message me, are you still coming? And I, I, I wasn't actually going to go because I thought maybe I wouldn't be wanted there because I'd stopped going to the Kingdom Hall and I'd sort of cut back my contact with the congregation. So I asked her, do you still want me? And she's like, of course, why wouldn't I want you there? Please come. I was like, okay, I'll be there. So this was a few months of not being at a Kingdom Hall and no interaction really with the witnesses. So I was so nervous. And it was my first time driving on the motorway to get there. So I was already a bit shaky. And I pulled up to the Kingdom Hall and looking at the building was enough to make me feel sick. And then as I look out of my windshield, I've just stopped the car. There is an elder from my congregation stood there with his arms folded, looking at the floor. So I get out of the car. And he's still standing here like this. And he was just like, hello, Lacey. What's your intention of coming here today? And it was one of those moments that you almost want to just laugh. It was... And he was, was saying in- this without making eye contact with you. Yeah. He said, arms folded, looking away. Sort of, hello, Lacey, what's your intention of coming here? I Did you think he might like, catch something if he looks at you? I, d- I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. what I, I was scared I'm going to slap him, maybe. I don't know. I definitely felt like it after if I didn't feel like it before. But he clearly felt threatened if he was saying, what's your intention in coming here? Yeah. How did That must have felt immediately like, oh, no, I sh- I've made a big mistake. I shouldn't be here. You know? Well, that almost was like a verbal slap to the face, really. Yeah. It was. It already took a lot of sort of courage to, to go. And then to be asked after I've been invited by the bride was after I said I was invited immediately, unfolded arms, relaxed, okay. And then that was it. And, I, and my sister came out to meet me by that point. And I was just looking around, like laughing, crying at the same time, shaking. I had to go to the bathroom and I was crying and my sister had to sort of like calm me down and my mom, you know, it's okay, come back in. And I walked past one of the elders that had initially said that they're not stepping down and he sort of grabbed my arm, not like aggressively, but sort of grabbed my arm like this to stop me. And I turned to look at him and he just, again, not no eye contact, He just said, I'm sorry. So I just scoffed and snatched my arm and went went into the Kingdom Hall. So, yeah, I I don't think that was was really treated as human, let alone a witness. Just astonishing behaviour. And and this, again, highlights... um, the fact that even though you, I mean, you weren't even like an apostate or anything. It's not no. like you were going around saying, oh, 1914 is a lie and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you were literally an abuse victim. And and this is the way they're treating you as though you've got some kind of contagious disease. It's it's just astonishing. I'd never said anything negative And I'd never gone around the congregation saying anything negative to anybody and I still haven't I haven't gone round I've um there's nothing that I've ever said that would give them any reason to be well to behave how how they did Mm. so um how eventually was did this get resolved because it did get resolved didn't it eventually yeah how did that happen it had to go to court so to get they wouldn't give the verbal statement so then it was, okay, we know you have a document. Give us the document. That was initially denied by the elders. They denied there ever being a document. So there was a long period of time between all of this sort of going on where from the start to finish, it dragged on a little bit because it was, give us the document, we don't have it. Um, and the police said, okay, fine, fair enough. I want a written statement saying and signed saying 
that there is no document, there's no written evidence of a confession. And around the same time, I had wrote to the congregation requesting my GDPR information, which is really interesting for any witness to do, actually, regardless of abuse, just in general, because I don't think people are aware that you get graded. You like I so I requested my information and they they wrote back and they sent me my information. And on my two what, April, sorry, just to clarify, when you say you got graded, was this yeah. for metropolitan work or something? Yeah, so it Not was witnessing. Yeah. It, oh, I don't know how to explain it. It was two A4 sheets of paper with some crap that seemed irrelevant to GDPR, but okay. Mm. And then it had it wasn't even for the Metropolitan. I think maybe it's what you get graded before you do it. Mm. But it was dress and grooming. Stamina was also on there. And I got a B. <laughs> B for stamina. Oh, I got God. a B for dress and grooming as well. And I actually can't remember what, what the third thing was. I think there Can was you remember other- going to any assault course or any or any training track uh, with an elder there timing you and oh what? What's it called? That beat test that's now like illegal. But it was so, just <laughs> So you, you managed to get these documents, you know, and 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 you're saying that this GDPR request, which you rightly recommend for anyone to do, um yeah. Uh, you mentioned that this ha- might have played a part in the yeah. information eventually being released. Going yeah. To the, yeah. So initially it was, we don't have the information. So around the same time the police were, you know, sign a statement saying you don't have it was around the time I'd requested my GDPR. So in my GDPR on the, the last page at the very bottom was just a very small set. It was about this big, just like about two, three lines and it was, if I remember it correctly, hearing to a confession of child abuse uh, against Clifford Whiteley um, to, to me uh, um, from the age of about 10, no older than 11. And it was one act of digital penetration. And that word for word is actually what they had had written that those expressions is what they have used and they would have had that from the start so the police got involved I think the end of Feb early March and this whole case didn't end until this year did when you say just to be just to be absolutely clear the elders were denying that there had even been a confession so the police were saying, well, in that case, give us a signed statement saying that there was never a confession. Yeah. Did they ever provide that signed statement? It had to go to court. They didn't hand it over. It had to go to court. So they refused to give a signed statement saying that there wasn't a... a well, um, they, yeah, they, re- they refused to do a statement because their next email or response to the police was, actually, we do have the information. And the reason why we didn't tell you before is because the elder had forgot. Well, at, at this point, at this point, we're we're dealing with um, just blatant lying, aren't we? Yes. It's just blatant lying. So, gosh, and and so in the court hearing, and this, by the way, it's all it was in the media, wasn't it? Um, yeah. In the court hearing, they managed to finally get this confession from the police. Yeah, from but the it wasn't elders. easy because two brothers from Bethel were sent to oppose the request for the document. So these brothers weren't even involved with with the case. Um, they didn't even know what was going on. They were just told, you go to this court and you oppose this hearing. And unfortunately, well, unfortunately, fortunately, they didn't win so the police the people turned up from Bethel how how do you know that they were instructed to just oppose the hearing because the police had spoken to them and he told us what sort of he said you know they seem like (laughs) nice people but they were just told to go there they didn't really know the full story they didn't actually know 
Oh, really? The specifics <laughs> of the case. So when, when, when the police uh, interviewed or spoke to these people who turned up at court, that's when it all came out that, oh, actually, we've just been sent well, here. Um, they showed up without a barrister, so right. they actually didn't have a voice to the judge anyway. Um, but I think that the police were the ones that said, you know, that they can speak, whatever, it's fine. But they actually showed up without a barrister anyway. So technically, they didn't even have a voice to the judge. Absolutely astonishing. Um, and obviously, the the case was also uh, the subject or part of the um, evidence that was produced before ICSA. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you were listening in when Paul Gillies was questioned about your case. Uh, just for the benefit of viewers, I'm just going to show part of Gillies' questioning about your story. So there is a balance here of confidentiality for the reasons we discussed earlier. So they were asking simply to put it in writing, and if they had the permission of Mr. Whitley to talk to them, then that was fine. Consent was okay. Mr. Whitley refused to um, give his consent. So at that point, the elders were advised uh, that they basically need to ask uh, the police con constable to get a production order. A lot of distress was caused to the young lady. And um, it's understandable because there was a long delay. But what was the reason for the long delay? PC Enzo puts in his statement that uh, he was, the elders weren't cooperating. They weren't cooperating on his terms, but they were asking for it in writing, and they were asking for the consent, and then they were asking for a production order. So as you rightly said, it took till October until the DCNs or actually got that production order. And when that went before the judge, my understanding was that the decision was, yes, that is relevant, but I don't take confidentiality lightly was the judge's expression. Okay. Um, and uh, I think we have a witness statement from PRA 42, which is, Danny, if we could just get that up quickly, who's the victim in this case, JLE 00005100001. And one can see at 002, Mr. Clifford and Mr. Dobson, at paragraph 11, stayed in touch with PRA 42 and they sent messages saying to pray and that they were praying for him. Um, and she said how upset she was because Mr. Dobson said what a good elder Mr. Whiteley had been and how he had helped the congregation. She finding her upset on the basis that this was on or around the time when he had confessed to sexually assaulting this young woman. Um, and um, at paragraph 19, if we could go to the next page, please, Danny, 003, she says, Mr. Whiteley's confession to the elders was the biggest single piece of evidence we needed in our, in our pursuit of a conviction for his abuse. Without this confession, it was just my word against his in what was a historic abuse case. Um, DCN Sir asked Mr. Whiteley for his permission to obtain the details, but he refused, knowing that the elders would not cooperate, as was their policy. And 23, once I was made aware of these developments, I asked, them, I asked them to meet with me to explain why they wouldn't help the police. And then they said, paragraph 21, began by sharing a passage from the Bible about slander, explaining that because they are under a particular oath, they are unable to speak to the police. Now, that's not my understanding and reading of the Watchtower article. So how could they have if they'd been speaking to the branch office, as everybody says that they should have been, how could that information have been miscommunicated to them in such a profound manner? Well, you have the, the statement there of a distressed lady, and that's understandable, uh, because she was being told that the elders were not cooperating. And what it appears that she wasn't told was that the elders were cooperating. They were just simply asking the police to put the questions in writing. Uh, and if there was no consent from Mr. Whitley, then to get a production order. Basically, that whole process could have happened in a few weeks. So it doesn't seem to me as though there was a failure of our policy there. It was more the fact that uh, the process was drawn out 
uh, because as I see it, uh, the police officer seemed to delay the process in getting uh, the consent and then the production order. So it's understandable why she would be feeling uh, that way. And, and But if I can just indicate that, why would she have said about slander of paragraph 21 unless that was what the elders had told her? He wouldn't necessarily be something that you in and of yourself would know or would think about. So are you suggesting she's mistaken in um, believing that that's what the elders said? Um, I don't know what the elders said because they haven't had the chance to comment on her statement. But if you're asking about confidentiality, I will read you the verse that could be applicable in a situation like this. It's Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 9. And it simply says, but do not reveal what you were told confidentially. So I was listening to all of this and I was knowing the details of your story completely beside myself with rage that Paul Gillies was putting up a pretense of caring about you. Um, how did all of this come across to you? Oh, that you couldn't have someone with such fake emotion. You couldn't have had anybody worse to be there trying to act like they're sympathetic. He was putting so much emphasis on the fact that it was 10 years ago. So much emphasis on the fact that it happened 10 years ago. Uh, he just, there was nothing. that Whatever emotion that he was trying to present, it was just emotionless. Do, do you feel he was, he was in a very clever way trying to invalidate your trauma by I suggesting, think, yeah. Trying to protect, trying to protect Cliff. Like I mm. say, he didn't even say his name. Mm. He, he was almost, he was saying, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he didn't say his name. And I think that's when she said, you can say, you can say what, what his name is. He's a criminal. And what did you make of his attempts to excuse the elders by by suggesting that it was okay for them to he he was trying to argue that it what they weren't frustrating the police investigation they were they were purely sticking to their rights of not having to what did you make of all of that argument it given that i was sort of going through it for over a year and what i was hearing from the police and what the elders were saying in their statement is two different stories Mm. And I don't think any part of me is ever going to think the police were lying about trying to convict a paedophile. Why would anything that they were updating and informing compared to what the, the witnesses are saying, saying in their statement? So, I mean, obviously, we're still waiting for the findings of, of the extra inquiry. Um, but are you happy with the way your story was treated in the questioning of Gillies? I think there was, I think, but given that the, the time period that they had for this hearing and how many cases they had to talk about, I think, yes, some of the important points were sort of touched upon. There were other areas that were equally important that, that could have been brought up. Um, like, for example, the whole, we know that he's a paedophile. But given the time frame, I think it was, they've mentioned, you know, enough of what they need to. Yeah, I suppose at least the story got mentioned, even yeah. if Paul Gilley's response was utterly disingenuous yeah. and, and dismissive at least it was an opportunity to introduce your story so that I think one page is even part of the uh, material that's publicly available, one, one page of your statement. Yeah. Um, so it's at least been been included in the whole thing, but I, I take your point and wholeheartedly agree that, look, one, one and a half days <laughs> or whatever it was doesn't do justice to an organisation that is so prolific. Yeah. Um, in with these issues, so um, all I can do is is thank you for 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 
well, first of all, protecting children by by pursuing the whole thing legally, despite all of the barriers to reporting that we've discussed and how difficult it is to even verbalise what happened, but to then go one step further and make sure that your story was included with ICSA. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that you had the courage and bravery to do that. So thank you. It was a happy, sort of, it was a very happy moment to be involved in it. Because even if it, if, I think I said before on a pre, the previous time I was on here anonymously, um, when they said about the numbers of people that uh, have been abused and, and things like that. And, you know, he didn't seem phased by the number. And mm. I said before, one is too many. Yeah. And Which is what phased. they simply don't seem to get that, do they? Uh, that one is too many. Okay, well, look, again, I'm filled with admiration. Um, if there's anyone watching, particularly, I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested to hear what you would say to perhaps an abuse victim who uh, is reticent about uh, coming forward or, um, or sharing their experience, whether with the police or with uh, someone who can give them some kind of counselling. Um, what would be your advice? I mean, counselling is absolutely fantastic. Obviously, you're taught through the organisation that it's almost the devil. And if you go, all they're going to tell you um, is, is it's the religion's fault. They're going to make you lose your relationship with, with Jehovah. It's the devil. And um, they fear monger it quite a lot, actually. But counselling is absolutely fantastic. You, If you need to talk sometimes to somebody that's that you don't know is really really been really good really beneficial if you haven't come forward and it has happened then I urge you to talk and regardless of how you are treated by the elders which I will guarantee is not going to be the correct way you will not get the help and you will not get the love from the elders is you go forward anyway. You, you just have to, because the elders aren't, they're there to protect the congregation, but they will not. So in order to protect other people, protect yourself from months, years more of pain and hurt and suffering, from holding on to it, from being silent, is going to kill you more than it's affecting the abuser. They're probably living their life happily. Nothing's been said. I can do it again. No one can touch me. The elders aren't going to save the congregation and they're also not going to help you. So you, you really have, you've got to do it for yourself as well because it's not worth the years of suffering in silence. And I'm, one thing that we perhaps haven't touched on, and maybe we can um, do so briefly, um, where are you up to now? Because during this whole process, it seems that you were in kind of a, a state of transition. Uh, you started off the whole thing by kind of sticking up for the organisation in front of the police and saying, oh, yes, of course, they're going to cooperate. Um I, I'm sure that your experience made you progressively jaded and disenchanted with the organisation. So where are you at this point in terms of your perception of the organisation and the extent to which you respect and admire it? So, uh, wow. So with, with the organisation, so everything that happened with this case, they were of no help to. Um, fortunately, Cliff did get convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. And they had no, no part, of, no help with that really. Yeah, going from defending it and it being such a big part of your life and your family. And like I said, I was very zealous. I was a pioneer for three, four years. My, my view now, there is no God behind that organization. There's, there's no God. There is no love. It is fear mongering. It is lies. It is control. And 
I don't have any respect for it whatsoever. My, my problem is there's people that are in it and it is their whole life. And I would never say anything to those sorts of people because if you take that away from them, they have nothing because of what it's done to people, how it traps you to not, not be able to have a life. I know people that don't have pension plans because when they were young, they were told Armageddon's coming, don't pay into a pension. Now they're old and barely surviving. People are told you can't have an education and now they're struggling to find a decent job. It is just awful. It is an awful organisation and it, it's sort of strange to see it this way when your whole life it has been this magical true religion to actually it's just a sham it's not all orientated around god in are any happy, way. are you happier since leaving i am very happy i i didn't actually realize how miserable i was until you leave it's just like I said, when I came for that two month vacation, it was like a whole other life outside of the organization when you stop doing things that, you know, it sort of as the two months went on, it was okay. Well, I have witnessed like less and less. And now, I mean, it's been a long, it's been a long year. <laughs> it's been a long year, Lloyd, since last year, nearly two years now. It's been a long two years and it's been a hard two years, no doubt. And the, the sad thing is I'm always going to have the bad days, whether it's about what happened with my stepdad, whether it's about the religion and the trauma that comes with the organisation. No doubt I'll have bad days with that. But I'm happier to deal with it than I was before. Because, you know, I'm not going to die at Armageddon. <laughs> No, no one's going to die at Armageddon. That's an amazing first step into realising, wow, this is life. There's so much out there. There's so much I can do, I can achieve. I can go to university. It's just insane what life is like compared to, to what it was. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, I've never been happier. Wonderful. Well, after all of the... Uh, sadness and darkness in your life it's it's nice to end on that positive note uh, because I'm sure many will be inspired not just by your bravery and courage as an abuse survivor but also the fact that you have managed to heal or you're or you are healing and you are finding joy in life so that's that's wonderful and again I'm just filled with admiration for all that you've done so thank you Lacey thank you so viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I know I have. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such interviews. And as always, thank you for watching.